Holy Spirit, we invite you here this morning, and we ask that you'd have your way in the Word and in our hearts, uh, Lord, that you would begin to bring transformation and give us vision uh, that we may see uh, your heart towards us and the plan that you have for your church and for the future of our country and what you're doing in the earth. I pray that it would make us alive in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, so if you have your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy 28, and we're going to read some Old Testament, and we're going to talk about it. The Bible says that all God's promises are yes and amen in Christ. So the promises that we find in Deuteronomy or in the Old Testament are applicable to us as Christians. What has changed, and people ask, well, what's the difference, and what has actually changed then in Deuteronomy, because we'll read the beginning, and I, I want you to hear it. The problem is, is we teach out of the Old Testament as if it's still the Old Testament, and this is where the church has gotten into a lot of trouble, and what has confused so many Christians, and which has actually resulted in us not seeing these promises. So I want to show you how this becomes over a nation, over a church, over a family, and ultimately over us individually. We're going to be talking about, as I said last week, we're talking about how we open doors in our life to things, and as we see that we struggle with the same things over and over and aren't able to get freedom for it, or we seem to keep falling in the same areas or trapped by the same areas, whether that's depression or discouragement or anxiety or lust or any kind of addiction, um, or, or just feeling like you can't get a job every time you try it falls apart, or, or, you're, or you're insecure, whatever the issue is. Um, there, there are those things in our life, and I don't even know so much that it's an open door, but it's maybe a wounding or something, but, but you'll see a pattern develop in your life. And I think most of us are aware of some of those patterns. If any of you spend any time with the Lord at all, you, you become aware that you have these patterns, and so we immediately try to do better. We immediately try to figure out ways we're going to be able to do that better. And um, I've seen no success in my life uh, when I've tried. I've only actually seen success when I've totally given up. Uh, that's when I've seen the Lord actually step in because He wants all the glory, okay? But let's start in Deuteronomy 28, and I want to show you what begins the problem. Now, we read this, and Deuteronomy is true. The Old Testament is true, but we need to read it in the context of when it was true, Deuteronomy 28 is partly true now and not totally true anymore, okay? Let me say that again. A lot of the stuff that you read in the Old Testament and here in Deuteronomy is only partially true now. It was 100% true when Moses wrote it for that time and for that people, but it no longer is totally the truth for us anymore. Now, while it is true, it's that now, it's not that this is false now, but now there is something better, and that is called the new covenant. There's something better. There's a better way of doing this. So let's start. It says, now it shall be, this is Moses talking, um, uh, he's using the voice of God and, and, and speaking on God's behalf to the people uh, of Israel. And this is after they've come out of, verse 1, after they've come out of Egypt. Now it shall be, if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all His commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you, if you obey the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country." Blessed shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of the ground and the offspring of your beasts and the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket, this means your bank account now, and your kneading bowl, that would be your work, whatever you do for work. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed will you be when you go out. And the Lord shall cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They will come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing upon you in your barns and in all that you put your hand to. He will bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself 
as he swore to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. So all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they will be afraid of you. The Lord will make you abound in the land and the Lord, that the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open for you his good storehouses, the heavens to reign to your land in its season and to bless the work of your hand. And you shall lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you, will, um, and you only will be above and you will not be underneath if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I charge you today to observe them carefully and do not turn aside from any of the words which I command you today to the right or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. Okay, this is a very good passage, very true. And these were the Ten Commandments and the other some uh, 316 laws, or sorry, 613 laws that Israel was supposed to keep. They were supposed to keep all of them. You'll see it later in Deuteronomy. It's the same thing. If you keep all that the Lord God has commanded you, then you will prosper. Now, I won't read it all, but then these are the consequences of disobedience. But it shall come about if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe all his commandments and his statutes, which I charge you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed you'll be in the city, cursed you'll be in the country, cursed shall be your, your basket and your kneading bowl and the offspring, and on and on it goes. So the Lord uh, did that so that they would stay in check. Now, the problem is, is we've taken passages like this and we still preach them today in a New Testament era, in a New Covenant era. And it's depending on how you teach this can make it either radically false and be part of what Paul always accused the circumcision group to be, the super apostles, or this would be considered false teaching. So depending on how you teach this, it could either be radically false or it could be incredibly true and life-giving. Now typically, and I've heard this growing up and I've heard many preachers still today preach it the old way, they will say things like, we need to keep the Ten Commandments in school, and America is in a mess, or Canada is in a mess because we took prayer out of the school, we took the Ten Commandments out of the school, um, you know, how are these kids going to know morality? We've taken that out, and that all needs to come back. We need to get back to the Ten Commandments. Um, I heard an inter international speaker who's really well known on TV, and he said, if America wants to see revival, we have to go back to the Ten Commandments. Lots of churches do series on the Ten Commandments. Um, uh, a church that I used to teach at, uh, you know, years ago, they've kind of gone back to law teaching. And uh, recently I was, I was on their website and they had a sermon called, It's the Law, Deal With It. <laughs> oh, God. Um, so we, we, we preach keeping these laws in order to get the blessing of God to come into our life. One of the biggest um, examples of this you'll see, and their subtleties are everywhere. They won't always be spoken harshly, but I want to train your ears to listen for it. One of the biggest ways we hear this is in the law of tithing. If you want God to bless you, you must tithe. Now, we, we preach giving here, and you want to give and be generous to the Lord, and it is because God's trying to develop a heart of generosity, he doesn't want your 10%. He might want 30. It, I don't know. It, it's between you and the Lord and whatever. But maybe you're going to start off at two. I, I don't know. Or nickels. Whatever, wherever you're at. But God wants to stretch our faith to show that we can trust him, that he's a generous, uh, generous God so that generosity can flow through your life. It's his desire. So that's one area that you will see us re re resort to the law. Now, one of the reasons pastors do that is because it's just easier, right? It's easier to preach law and condemnation than it is to preach grace. Because in order to wield the sword of grace in a church, you need a lot of wisdom. You need how to know how to motivate people through grace and ask them to come to the Lord like we did this morning, come into this fountain of life. You just preach a lot of grace and, and then people just think it's a right to sin. And so it, it requires some wisdom and some delegate teaching to, to kind of come up the middle. But when you come up the middle of that, boy, it's really powerful. There's a very powerful stream in the middle. And we did a sermon year, uh, 
beginning of the year, I think, is called the tensions of grace. And so we hold the idea of God's law in one hand, and we hold the idea of the, of the Holy Spirit empowering us to live righteously and holy in the other. And those always have to be held in tension. Now, we do a lot of grace teaching here. Grace is not an excuse to say, yeehaw, I can live however I want, and God doesn't even doesn't care about holiness, and he doesn't care about righteousness, and I can screw people in business, I can take advantage of people, I can get drunk and sleep around, and nothing matters to God, and he'd just love me anyways. Now, it is true that God will love you anyways, but you're going to bring a lot of death and destruction into your life, and it is not why God saved you. God didn't save you so you can just go do whatever you want. The Bible says that we are now slaves of righteousness. God had an intention of saving you. The number one intention was to give you a bountiful life. The, the number one intention was to give you an abundant life. The number two intention was exactly what the Lord says here to, to Jerusalem or to Israel. There's no Jerusalem yet. What he's saying to them is basically, I want the other nations to be jealous of you. I want them to see you. Now, in this case, he's saying, I want them to be afraid of you. But the idea is God wanted Israel to raise up as a nation that other nations would look and see that God reigns, you know. So I love this song that we're singing, Hallelujah, all my days, God reigns, God reigns, God reigns. And so the way we show that God reigns is when we believe in God's grace and we abide in him and we abide in that stream and we become full of life, you see, people see God reigning in our lives, right? When we just do whatever we want, we use grace as just our, our catapult into sin, people don't see that and they aren't drawn to God. So we don't, we don't exemplify the, the character and the person of God when we just do whatever we want. Now, that isn't meant to make us feel guilty or condemned. It's meant for us to reset our compass, right? If you continue to struggle in a certain area of your life, then you need to abide more, right? You need to abide in that stream because when you abide in Jesus, it's when things change. Now, why this is a problem is when we start to say to people, okay, so now you need to keep all the Lord's commandments. And the reason your life is a mess and the reason it's not blessed is because you're breaking the commandments of God, you know. You're not keeping the Sabbath, you know. You're mowing your lawn on Sunday and you shouldn't. You should rest all day. And so if you break that, that's one of God's commands. Or you're not tithing, you know, and, and, and then that's bad. Or, or maybe you're gossiping and so we do a sermon on gossip, you know, thou shalt not gossip. Or, or we're coveting. So you hear 101 sermons on not being materialistic, unless I'm the only one. Has anybody heard a sermon on not being materialistic? Anybody? Nobody? I'm the only one? <laughs> raise them. Look around. I want you to raise your hands up. Oh, don't covet. You, you, you shouldn't like things too much. And, you know, we got to be sold out for God and not love stuff. And, and so that's really hard to, to imagine how you're going to do that in real life. And, and then to what degree do you take that? You've got nice kitchen cabinets, so should you just scratch them up? You know, is that what we should do? Just, just sand them randomly. Yeah, well, they're not nice now, you know. Put a couple cracks in your granite, you know. Smash your TV so you... You have to look through it or throw away your TV. You shouldn't even have a TV if you're a serious Christian. You know, all this, all this kind of stuff, right, that we teach. When I was growing up, it's like, is TV an idol in your life? Do you spend more time watching TV than in prayer? I'm like, yeah, for sure, you know. And I'm like, well, it's like I just played Xbox for two hours. I'm going to have to go on a prayer marathon, right? And so we just, we just, you just constantly feel convicted. You just, I wouldn't even say it's convicted. I, you constantly feel condemned. You constantly feel guilty about what other idols in your life. And because it says, you know, you, you turn aside from any of the words which I command you today to the right or to the left and go after other gods to serve them. I heard another preacher recently said, the reason America's in decline is because of our young people. Because they have no sense of morality and they're all, they're all having sex and, and, and it's because of all the sex in our culture, and that's why America's going to hell in a handbasket. That's why everything, so it's all the young people's fault. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. I couldn't have planned that better. That was so good. You know, and so, so we preach these kind of messages, which just heap more condemnation, Right? And so we, we have to tell our young people, and th this is the problem, and God's really angry about this, and, and, and you've got to change this. And, and again, we've used this illustration before. If, if God was really angry about all the sex going on on the earth, then he would be perpetually angry, 
There wouldn't be a minute that he wasn't angry. He'd be constantly angry, not a lot of room for goodness and mercy. Now, God has ways that he's instructed us to live in the area of sex and sexuality that he wants us to follow because it's best for us, because it's most healthy for us, because we will enjoy it most in the boundaries that he set up. When we go outside of that comes pain and suffering and heartache and hurt and devastation and disease. So God doesn't tell us to stay within the boundaries because he's happy about rules. You see, and this is kind of how we've pitched God, that God wants to stay in the rules because he's scared of being offended, that God wants us to keep in the rules because when we go out of the rules, he's mad. It's like we stay in the box, God's happy, we step out of the box, and it ruins his day. And so, so we're constantly in this mode of trying not to ruin God's day. We're that we, so we left with this feeling constantly that we're disappointing him, that we are unsatisfactory to him. Now, the problem is we don't just sit in one area. Maybe you wrap all that area up, so you hurry up and get married, so you stop you know, doing sex outside of the boundaries of what God sets, but then you've got other problems. And you've got other issues. And, and so we constantly feel, I'm just, I don't measure up. I don't measure up. I don't measure up. And so these kind of get sermons get preached over and over and over again. And you're like, well, no wonder my life's a mess. No wonder it's so horrible. I don't keep all the commands of the Lord. Because I'm reading here in Deuteronomy. And if I read earlier in Deuteronomy and I read earlier in, in the Torah, I find out what all those laws are. And I'm like, there's a lot of laws, you know. I have trouble keeping my New Year's resolution. And there's like 613 of these. So it's like, forget it. I, I, I just can't, right? But we know we should because we want our lives to be blessed, right? And then we flip to the other side and go, well, you shouldn't want your life to be blessed because God's not all about prosperity. Jesus wasn't driving around in Mercedes Benz, was he? You know, and we get messages like that. Jesus was poor and homeless. Jesus wasn't poor and homeless. I mean, the scriptures that say the Son of Man has no place to lay his head or tongue are something totally different than the fact that Jesus was sleeping out in the rain every night. Let's be, let's be honest. Jesus was healing everybody he met, and nobody said, hey, you can bunk here for the night, Jesus. Nobody. You know, Jesus wasn't homeless. He, he could have stayed anywhere he wanted to. He, he could have just walked through the walls, Riley, and just slept where he wanted to. So I don't think he was homeless. And so this, this becomes a poverty mentality because you should feel bad. And we preach lots of sermons against rich people. Oh, beware of the rich, you know. The rich are bad. Rich are horrible, you know. The rich don't know God. The rich can't enter the, the kingdom because camels can't get through needles, you know. So, so therefore, a rich can't get in. And then we preach against riches. And so then, by what standard do we govern the rich? Because we're all rich here in Canada. Even if you're broke, you're rich compared to most people in the world. So what's too much? Should you have, not have bookshelves for all your books that you could read online? So throw away the bookshelves. You don't really need carpet. You can live right on your, your plywood, so throw away the carpet. How much heat do you really need? Get a sweater down at Value Village. You know, you stop spending all the money, give it all to missions. You know, actually, you don't even need to live in a house. Like, you know, go live with the homeless people and start a ministry. I mean, at what point, at what point is, it, is it too much? At what point? And, and so you, you, we dump guilt on people and we dump condemnation. And everybody's trying to live life. Why? Because they want to be in God's blessing. So it's like, I'll make myself poor so God can bless me. But then when God tries to bless you, you just get rid of all your stuff and, so that you can continue to look poor before God so you feel like you're holy. Right? Jesus was trying to deal with a rich young ruler in the same way. He's like, what must I do to be saved? He goes, I, he, Jesus said, keep the commandments. He goes, yeah, I do them all. And he goes, yeah, but okay, so you do them all and you've done really good. Now I want you to sell your stuff, give it to the poor. And he's like, yeah, I can't do that. Jesus goes, yeah, I'll always find something you can't do. As long as you're depending on your righteousness and your ability to be a good Christian, Jesus and the Lord together will be mission number one in your life. It'll be their prime directive to prove you wrong. So how long do you want to go down that road? You can go down that road as long as you want, and he's eternal. He'll wear you out. You're temporal, he's eternal, and he is patient, right? <laughs> he is patient. He will wait you out. He can suffer way longer than you. He's got the resources and the team. I mean, he has a team, right? He's got a team. There's lots of evil in the world, and that's only one-third of the fallen angels. So, so he's still got two-thirds in his back pocket, and they can be full-time sent just to bring you trial and tribulation to wear you out. But God will always prove one point and one point alone he alone is righteous. 
He is righteousness, and your dependency has to be on him. Why this is wrong is because it doesn't tell the new story. Is it true that we are to keep all of his commandments? Yes, it is. But Jesus changes the parameters. Jesus changes the requirement for this blessing. What is the requirement now? Love. The requirement now is love. Jesus said all the law, which is Deuteronomy, all the law and all the prophets can be summed up in this one thing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. He said, if you do do these two things, everything else will be accomplished. So I don't have to worry about keeping all these laws. I just have to worry about love. Love is my only concern. Now, what some of us then try to do is go, all right, so I got to get good at love. So I'm going to go, there was that book I heard about, the, the five love languages. I'm going to buy that book, and I'm going to memorize it, and then I'm going to do it. I'm going to start figuring out, mapping out. So I just walk around with my iPad all day going, okay, what are your love languages? You know, okay, good. Brayton, what's your love language? Good. Gifts. You know, Brad, oh, gifts. Kelly, gifts. Oh, no. Uh, Carter, gifts. Oh, crap. Uh, oh, looks like everybody's love language is gifts. I'm going to be broke. I've got to buy everybody gifts, right? Or your love language is words of affirmation. So you just run around the church going, hey, you look nice today, nice hair, nice shirt, nice shirt, nice watch, you know, nice shirt, like that, nice shoes, look, nice glasses, nice purple, like that, nice jeans, nice Bible. That's exhausting. You see, but in, in the human way of doing things, we, we, we just try to do things to the extreme. We extreme everything that we learn and everything that we do, we, we kind of take it to the end. So we, we go after how I can fix it myself. How can I make it better myself? You know, the easiest way to become a, a better human being, a better husband, a better wife, a better employee, a better son, daughter, a better believer, it's not you trying to figure out love. You have to hang out with love. You have to hang out in the stream of where that heart of God's love and grace flows from. And that's in worship, in his presence. Because I'll tell you what, and, and you experience it a lot pastoring, right? Because you get drawn from a lot, and so you burn out really quick, right? I have to pray more often than most people because you're being drawn from all the time. And if I don't for a while, you get really irritable with everybody, you know? It's like so-and-so's called me again. Oh, my God, like, figure it out, you know? It's like, just go spend time with the Lord, you know, and you, you just lose your grace. You start to become edgy and irritable, you know, and you're like, Lord, I don't know if everything's happening. I don't know if the church is ever going to grow. It's like people are all busy doing stuff and, uh, and you start to feel like that, right? Now, I know that's not spiritual, you know, but that's true. That's how you start to feel. So I have to go away. And I've joked about this many times, but that's when Victoria says to me, you know, you, I don't even know if you're a Christian. You need to go spend time with Jesus in the basement, you know. So I'll go downstairs and I'll just begin to put the worship music on and just let that wash over me for a while. And then I'll start to pray and start to worship the Lord. And then I come out of there and I'm crying. I'm like, I love everybody, you know. I got to encourage this person. Then I call this guy and this lady and, you know, God's doing this. And I'm writing encouraging things on Facebook and words of encouragement. It's just like all this life and energy, you know. And 10 minutes later, I was, I was just ready to quit. I'm like, I'm done. I got enough of my own problems trying to fix everybody else's problems. See, and we all feel that way. But God wants to mature the church up so we don't run after the pastor. We don't run after the elders. We don't run after good Christians. Well, will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? Your prayers are magical. Will you pray for me? And my prayers are magical. And you know what? All my prayer in the world for you isn't going to do a, a, just even a touch to what it will do when you go spend time with Jesus. Because Jesus wants to meet you. Jesus wants to spend time with you, not me and you. He wants to spend time with me. He wants to spend time with you. He doesn't want me to spend time for you to tell you what Jesus thinks of you. Then I become the mediator. The Bible says there's one mediator between God and men, and that's Christ. 
but we've used pastors and spiritual leaders as the mediator. No, you just go talk to God and then come and tell me a word. It's like, you go talk to the Lord. You know, years ago, I was uh, involved in a church. There was a lot of charismatic and, and stuff and different people there with prophetic giftings. And, and um, I went after this one lady and I said, hey, I just, you know, I've been discouraged lately and just wondering if you had a word from the Lord for me. She's like, okay, I'll pray. I'm like, okay, good. And um, so she came, she emailed me a couple days later and she says, yes, the Lord gave me a word for you. And I said, oh, what's that? And, and uh, so she said, well, the Lord told me that, um, you know, he said that, uh, what was it again? Sorry. That you're not, uh, that you're not listening. The word is, is that you're not listening and uh, you're, you're, not, you're not seeking him and, and, um, and, and your hearts become closed and, and you're, you're not seeking his voice. You're seeking other voices. I'm like, whatever. That, it was so hurtful. I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about, you know. So I was, I was getting ready one morning. I said, well, Lord, I mean, I asked for a word and that was the word and I can't just go whatever. I have to address that. And I said, what, what, what does that mean, you know? And, like, and, and I said, you know, like, I know she's wrong, but, you know, what can I learn out of that? What, what do you want to say to me? And he said, no, she was actually right. Oh, she said to me, you've become foolish. That's what she said. you become foolish. And I said, what do you mean? That's so hurtful. Why are you saying that to me? I'd be, you're saying she's right? He goes, yeah, she's right. He said, since when do you and I not talk? Since when do I not commune with you that you need to run around and ask some lady in the church to come to me to get a word for you? You've become foolish and dark in your thinking. And he really rebuked me. He said, you come to me and ask me. You don't run to another person and tell them to go get a word for the Lord. You get a word from the Lord. Because the Lord can speak to you in a way that nobody else can. He has the full knowledge of the situation. And not only that, but he knew you in your mother's womb. And he knows you better than anybody can know you. And so he can speak to you better than anybody can speak to you. And so it requires God wanting to be alone with you. But you see, we don't want to do it. We want to do a million other things than go away and spend time with the Lord. Because we think we're too busy or we think we've got a million things on the go and we just can't. And you can be. You can be. And the Lord will just make sure you're not busy. He can remove your busyness. You don't have time to spend with the Lord. He can make sure he frees up some time for you, right? But most of us are not at where God would like us to be. Most of us are stuck in our life, and we're, tre- we're just treading. Our wheels are spinning, and we haven't really gone anywhere, and we haven't advanced. And part of the reason is God's saying, I want you to come away with me and spend time with me because in my presence, there's fullness of joy. In my presence, you're going to get vision for your life. The Bible says it's for lack of vision that my people perish. We perish all the day long because we don't see what God sees. You know, Jesus only ever did what he saw the Father doing. And how do you think he did? He wasn't just some robot that just was walking around the earth constantly knowing what God was doing. Jesus would pray through the night. And, and he would get his instructions for the next day. He, Jesus, being all God, needed to communicate with the life force of God, with the Holy Spirit of God, so he would know what to do. And I don't know how I imagine how I'm going to figure out what I'm supposed to do if me being 100% human, not 100% God and 100% human, just all human, all flesh, how am I going to figure out what I'm supposed to do when I don't do the same thing that Jesus did, Right? God's not looking for you to try to be good. He's not looking for you to try to be perfect. He can work on all that. But he can't work on it when you're not in his presence. He can't work on it when you don't commune with him. The longer you live out of that life stream, life's going to get rough for you. And God, it it just doesn't get rough by itself. I mean, it does. There's, There's things that will just happen. But God will make it intentionally difficult for you why James says, consider it joy when you enter various trials and temptations, or tribulations, sorry, because God's, God's testing your faith, not testing to say whether you get an A or B or a C, but he's testing it like, like a refiner tests metal. He'll hammer away and hammer away and hammer away 
till he gets perfection. This is what it means when Scripture says that God is working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose because God's trying to work good in you. Now, sometimes that means you're going to have to lose your job. And sometimes that means you're going to have to go through some things. And sometimes, you know, because if you start seeing the same pattern in your life where I'm just not getting freedom, I am just keep having the same struggle again, then you need to get away with Jesus. And you need to say, Lord, why? Because it's like a warning, right? Have you ever had that warning light, any of you, in your car where you get that transmission light or the oil light and you're just like, oh, I don't know. Oh, I'm just hoping I just turn off the car, turn it on again. Oh, yeah, it's gone. You drive, and you're like, oh, it's there again, right? And those, that's what trials are like. When you start seeing the same repetition happen in your life over and over again, like you're constantly financially struggling, struggling. you shouldn't be. Why? Because we read Deuteronomy 28. We know all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. So if I have the spirit of grace in my life, and I, I'm a believer in Jesus then these blessings should follow my life. Everything I put my hand to should prosper. So if you experience that everything you put your hand to fails, something's wrong, and and God's not wrong, right? I, I know this isn't a fun sermon. We don't like these kind of messages. But you know what? God loves you enough to share it with you through me because if I want to see you guys all have an abundant life. I want to see you be blessed. I want to see Deuteronomy 28, the first part, to be true for you. And so I've lived by this principle in my life. I've said, Lord, your desire for me is to be healthy and fit, and I'm not, and I don't know why. I don't know why. And I tried for years and years and years to get better. And it was just like two months ago, I was in the basement, cried out to the Lord, and I said, look, I'm done. I give up. I, I, I'm just going to be overweight and unhealthy the rest of my life because I can't make it better. I've gone to doctors, I've tried diets, I fasted for 40 days without food, and it made me worse. And everything I've attempted to do has only made it worse. And I said, I just give up, I can't do it. Like, if you don't save me, I'll never be saved. And the next day, David Crane texted me and said, yeah, I just, have, I just feel I should offer you to start training you. I'm like, oh, well, maybe that's the Lord. You see, it's when you kind of give up and say, Lord, my hope has to be in you. My hope has to be going and spending time with you. Because God's not looking for a little bit of God, a little bit of you. Heard a song the other day. Lord, it was a song Shine FM, and the guy's singing, Lord, help me. You know, help me be a little bit better. Help me be holy. Help me do this. God, you know, I'm going to tell you something. God is not interested in being the help. God's not interested in getting the other end of the couch so you can move it together. Because when it gets moved, he has to split the glory. It's a bit of you, a bit of him. God's interested in all the glory. He's kind of a glory hound. He wants all of it. Because all righteousness and glory belong to God, he's the only one that is good, you see. And it all belongs to him. He's not looking for your help. It's like when, when my kids were little, when Ethan was really little and I was having to move a big heavy box and he was like, Dad, can I help? And he'd put his little fingers on it, you know. And I'd go, sure, you can help, son. <laughs> you know? So and then he could say to Victoria later, yeah, I helped Dad move, you know. And, I, you know, and it's just cute because they're not helping at all. You know? Now, it can be cute but then as he gets older, he's like, oh, yeah, I help my dad all the time, move stuff around. Yeah, I'm pretty strong, you know. Two-year-olds could talk. I'm pretty strong. Dad was struggling the other day. I gave him a hand. See, and this is what happens. We become spiritually proud when we think we're part of it. But, you know, I, I know in the church I've been teaching that we pray for one another. So in the area you struggle, you pray for other people. Continue to pray for me. I'm praying for you guys. And lots of you are starting to run and lose weight and going on different diets for those of you who've been struggling in that area because I've been praying for you, been praying for me, and God's working in us, okay? It's a cool thing. God's working in us, right? So, that, so what happens is in six months from now, when I'm totally fit and healthy again, the glory goes to God and the church, right? Because we shared in it. 
It's not, it's not because of me. It's because I actually needed people because I don't want to need people, right? I learned to be a lone ranger for Jesus. I wanted to just be me and Jesus in the prayer closet. We'd figure out everything. And the Lord finally got a hold of me and said, you know what, you, you're going to need people. You're going to need someone. You're going to need to humble yourself and go to David because he looks good, you don't. You're going to have to fix that. And you're going to listen to him because he knows stuff that you don't, clearly, right? And so you're going to humble yourself and you're going to listen to him. Okay, Lord. You know. But we don't want to do it. We want to fix it all on our own, right? This is why we need the body, but we need to spend time with Jesus. We need to come into his presence we need to get with him so that that change can be him to happen. And the more that you do that, you will see that his burden is easy and light. That it's actually very easy to change when you abide in Christ. When you're willing to humble yourself and pray and then say, Lord, why does this keep happening to me? Show me. Give me vision. Give me eyes to see. Let me see it like you do. Lord, how come I can't get a job? What keeps happening to me? Lord, how come every time I make a friend, I lose a friend? Lord, how come people reject me? How come I always get taken advantage of? How come people bully me all the time? Why does it keep happening to me? Why can't I find a husband? Why can't I find a wife, Lord? Why? Because there should be blessing here and there's not. And I, I don't understand why. And the Lord goes, I need you to come away with me because I need to show you. And he might not show you the first time. It might, you might have to go deep. The answer might not be there right away. There's things that are in my life that, ha that, that I'm free from now, that if the Lord would have tried to remove 10 years ago and show me all the stuff that I needed to know for that piece to come out, that would have killed me. I couldn't have handled it all. So the Lord does it piece by piece, slowly, slowly. He, he starts to change you. But he is faithful and he will change you if you abide with him and you spend time with him. He will change you because he does. That's what he does because he gets the glory for it. Amen? Amen. Lord Jesus... I know those words are a little bit tougher this morning, but I ask that you would continue to work in all of our hearts to draw us into your presence. Lord, that we would know the sweetness of your presence, the glory of your presence. And Lord, that all life flows from there. The joy of our life, the, the, the direction. Lord, if we would just trust you, our days would go so much smoother, so much more directed. And, Lord, that we would learn to seek after you and not men. That we would not, we would not look to seek after others but, but for you. And, Lord, of course, there's times where we need to build one another up and encourage one another and strengthen one another. But, Lord, as the default, teach us to go after you first. To go after you first and gain wisdom and vision and sight, direction for our lives. Lord, let your peace come. Let us know that holiness and righteousness comes from abiding from you. It's an automation. It just happens. We just get more righteous when we hang out with righteousness. We get more wisdom when we hang out with wisdom. We get more loving when we hang out with love. We get more patient when we hang out with patience. We get more long-suffering and, and, and the ability to endure when we hang out with you because you're long-suffering. We're more kind and we're more generous when we hang out with kindness and generosity. And all of the good qualities in any human being, God, it drives from your river, your life, and your stream. Lord, I pray that you would cause us not to do it on our own anymore. That we would be a people that run to you always so that we can see the favor poured out in our life from you. In Jesus' name, amen.